Well, we're sitting here talking to Josh Abramson, who is the founder of Connected Ventures, which owns collegehumor.com, most notably, Busted Tees and Vimeo, the company's now owned by Interactive Corp. We're going to talk to him about where new media is going and uh, where his vision of the internet is headed. Where do you see user-generated video and user-generated content in general going? I think it's here to stay. Even television content is moving more towards the reality, sort of low-budget kind of feel. It's very difficult to make a user-generated clip that's a half an hour long. But to do something that's two minutes long, all you need is one idea and, um, and you know, a minimal amount of execution in some cases to make something that's entertaining. That's not to say that uh, you know, major media companies can't come around and make produced content in short form that's also going to be interesting, because I think they can. But um, I don't think that doing that is going to preclude people from making you know, their own videos and having them be popular. So as far as you're concerned, we will be watching two-minute user-produced videos for the foreseeable future uh, with content varying as time progresses. Sure, I think so. The average user doesn't really um, make a distinction between a user-generated clip and a clip that we produce. One of our most popular original clips is, is called Girls Costume Warehouse, and it's basically made to look like a, a commercial, a local cable commercial for this guy in New Jersey who's selling you know, costumes out of his garage, basically. By having this original content, we're able to get that initial viral buzz um, on our own. Sexy construction worker. Sexy fireman. Sexy referee. Sexy nun. Sexy detective. Not all our costumes are sexy. Another example would be, you know, just user-generated clips, which, you know, two years ago, we would be the first place to, to put them online, and then we would get all of that buzz initially because people would link to us because College Humor was the first place to find that, where now it's not always the case. And part of the reason why, you know, YouTube was so successful with the Chronicles of Narnia video, for example, is because it was up there before it was on College Humor. It might have been on College Humor 30 minutes later, but that 30 minutes was enough to, to you know, allow it to go viral on their site and not on ours. Do you have a point of view on how old media in general is doing at addressing the internet? It's taken people a while to understand that um, you know, television programming and internet programming are, are very different. And just taking a, 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 you know, a 30 minute show that was you know, great on television and, and chopping it up into four pieces and putting it online isn't going to work. And I think people are just starting to, to understand that, that you can't just repurpose television content for the web. At the same time, they haven't really figured out how to make good short form content. Well, who do you think of as your competitors? You know, Heavy.com, um, Maxim Online, Comedy Central, Facebook is a competitor. But you have links on your site to easily allow people to put your videos onto their Facebook pages. Sure. The so reason for that is, you know, while we might lose a page view um, to certain people who will watch a video on someone's Facebook profile instead of um, watching it on our site, you know, we also have the opportunity to get them to come back to our site and it's a way to, to reach users which aren't currently coming to our site. Do you, do you think it's important to get internet video onto your TV per se? I don't and I think that's something that a lot of people are wasting their time with. Uh, television content isn't really interesting on the web. I don't think that two-minute video clips are interesting on television. Right. You would never have five friends over and wa have them watch you click around on your computer screen and watch five viral videos. That's something that you kind of do on your own and it's a very personal interactive experience. Watching television is about, you know, groups of friends, you know, sitting down on a sofa, you know, watching watching TV and sort of committing to it for, you know, half an hour, an hour, however long. What is most exciting to you on the internet right now? Where do you see the most interesting new things emerging? APIs and the idea of opening up um, a site and allowing people to to share things and break down any walls that segregate content or information a dig or a delicious, even YouTube um, in a lot of ways. You know, all these sites are sort of tying together, which is really interesting. In order for, uh, for a website to be um, successful in the future, they need to, you know, be careful and really let the users dictate 
you know, where the site's going to go. Tell us a little more about who's doing things right and who's not on the internet and, and where you see success going with internet media. Someone who's not doing it right is, you know, a lot of the MTV network sites have sort of built these video players which are just not compatible with today's internet users. Um, it's really just um, a matter of, you know, best practices on the web and um, it's just interesting to see billion dollar companies that aren't able to, to do that. Yeah, it's embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> One of Friendster's biggest flaws, for example, was that they really tried to restrict the user's ability to do things. When MySpace came around and would let you have a profile for a band, for example, which was not allowed on Friendster, um, you know, people all of a sudden started you know, putting their bands on MySpace and restricting users to, to use the site the way you want them to use it isn't really going to be helpful. Time Inc. started OfficePirates.com, which at least superficially had an awful lot of similarities to yours, although it was aimed at a slightly older demographic, young men in offices. And then it failed pretty badly. Talk about what you think they were doing and, if anything, what you think they did wrong. You know, on the surface, the site looked good. The biggest flaw was just the content itself. Uh, it felt very contrived. It, it was not a surprise that it was a you know, massive company spending millions of dollars to try and create something that would be perceived as, you know, cool and, and, uh, and hip. I didn't feel good about anything that I saw on their site. People who aren't really trying to fight things that are, are going to happen um, regardless, I think, are sort of thinking about it the right way. Let's talk about advertising, what your philosophy is of what works and what doesn't. The last thing you want is for someone watching, you know, an advertisement that you produced and, and feeling angry about your product for making them wait before they can watch, um, you know, the video that they came to see. If you're going to a site like ESPN.com and you want to watch last night's game and that's the only place where you can get it, you might be willing to sit through a 30 second ad because you know that that's the only place to get it and you don't have to pay any money for it. So you kind of make that compromise. But I think when you're talking about viral videos and, and content that can be found on a lot of different you know, websites, um, it's a little bit more frustrating for the user to have to put up with that. So the way we think about it is really trying to create ad units that are not intrusive and don't affect the user experience, but also give the advertiser an ability to present their product in a positive light. It's not as much about being before the video or after the video, but maybe you know, more around the video. For example, we have a, a Lightbox um, ad unit, which is a co-branded page, which you know, when someone um, goes to watch a video, um, it comes up and is sort of surrounded by this skin that's you know, branded for you know, whatever sponsor that we're working with at the time. Even ads that run after the video, or what they call post-roll? I think post-roll ads are not as intrusive, but they're also much less effective. We like to create content for our advertisers and present them with an opportunity to get you know, involved with content on the site that you know, is being made specifically you know, around their product. For example, with the movie Slither, it's a scary movie, and, and in order to get people interact with the campaign, we had people go out and take scary videos of their own, you know, basically just picture, or videos of them scaring people. So, you know, people putting on a mask and hiding in a trash can or whatever. And then we had a contest where people voted on the scariest video. It wasn't really done to emulate Slither in any way, but it was done on a page which was clearly branded for the movie.